I'm Jim Haskell, editor of the Bridgewater Daily Observations, and I'm so fortunate today to be joined by my longtime friend and a longtime client of Bridgewater's, Alex Shahidi. Alex is the co-CIO of Evoke Advisors in, based in Los Angeles, California, and together we moderated a discussion with Bridgewater founder and co-CIO Ray Dalio and Jeremy Grantham, the co-founder and long-term investment strategist for Grantham, Mayo, and Von Otterloo, otherwise known as GMO. And Alex, maybe you can explain what we're about to do and how it all came about. Sure, Jim. It's great to be with you. I remember we started talking about putting this conversation together over a year ago. So I'm very excited to finally get both Ray and Jeremy in the room together, particularly given all the major forces at play today. We are truly living in historic times, so I can't think of a better duo to share the perspectives of the big cycles they see and what investors should do about it to help preserve and grow their wealth. You know, uh, Jim, I've spent the last 23 years searching for insightful investors uh, who have the unique ability to zoom out and see what others don't. And because they're better positioned to see big waves coming, uh, I, you know, I always think that they're less likely to get wiped out. Um, you know, I've, I met Jeremy for the first time about 20 years ago and, and Ray about 15 years ago. I still remember the first conversations with both. And I've been following him very closely ever since. And in my mind, they are two legends. Uh, they're both studying the past and writing about it. Uh, and they've demonstrated remarkable track records as proof, especially during big inflection points. I totally agree. And, you know, essentially what we did here is structure this conversation in two parts. In the first part, we asked both Ray and Jeremy to share their thoughts on the biggest dynamics they see in the world today, whether it was inflation, stock market bubbles, political shifts, or just the changing world order. And then the second part covers what investors can do about these things when it comes to their own portfolios. So I thought it was a really interesting conversation. I couldn't agree more, Jim. And it's a privilege to be able to share a conversation with these two investors, with our clients as well. So why don't we just jump right in? So Ray and Jeremy, thank you both for joining us. It's so great to have you both here. And just before we start, you know, you both known each other for a very long time. And Jeremy, in a conversation we had before actually taping this, you were talking to us about the first time you actually met Ray. Uh, it was at a Kodak Pension Fund event, event and, uh, and it was with the legendary investor, Rusty Olson. Uh, I thought it was a funny story. Maybe you can just quickly recount that story. I can't tell you the date, but I'm sure Ray can, but it was 25 years ago or thereabouts. And uh, it was in Martha's Vineyard and we had taken an earlier flight. And so we had like an hour and a half before cocktails started on this two-day event. And all, all of Eastman Kodak's managers, in, including the ancient Roy Newberger, were going to be there, and Hilda Ochoa, as I recall, a, a, a pal of mine and maybe Ray's as well. And so Ray and I, in desperation, took a, an hour and a half's walk along the beach. And, and Ray, as I suppose is his wont, talked. And I, as is not, definitely not my wont, listen, <laughs> I usually do all the talking. Anyway, this time I listened and Ray expanded uh, to such a fact that uh, uh, three days later, we had our annual conference. We were one of the first people to do that in the institutional investment business. We've done it for 40, 41 years. And um, on my presentation, I had a page towards the end that said how the market really works. And it was just one page of, of numbers. And at the bottom, it said, plagiarized from Ray Dalio. <laughs> well, so. I, re I, 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 I remember it uh, almost identically, except it, 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 I remember picking your brain, at least in, in any case, learning a lot from you. Um, and I certainly remember the conversation as being really, really interesting. And then uh, we were, we'd sit together on the bus as they would move us around. Yeah, uh, and the conversations, and that began our relationship, um, which has had a number of interesting conversations over uh, the last few decades. So I'm really happy to do this again with you, Ray. Why don't we kick off this conversation? You're a student of history, as is Jeremy, and you have both spent uh, many, many decades uh, throughout your careers thinking deeply about the lessons we can all learn from the past. 
Uh, can you take a few minutes to describe how you're thinking about the current environment and how it's similar or different from what you've seen in the past? One of the things I learned uh, really 1971 and then repeatedly is that surprises that happen in my lifetime happened to me. Many of many cases were for things that didn't happen in my lifetime, but happened in prior lifetimes, such as um, in 1971, I was clerking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, August 15th, uh, Nixon severs the relationship between gold and the dollar. So essentially defaulting. Um, and I walked on the stock exchange. I said financial crisis. And um, I would expect it to be down a lot. It was up a lot. I studied history and found that the exact same thing happened in March um, 5th, 1933, with Roosevelt doing the same thing, basically, uh, on the radio. And then I understood things better. So what happened for me over the last number of years is there are three big things that are happening in my lifetime that didn't happen. And I uh, actually found that uh, with research five. So the first is um, the amount of um, uh, debt creation and monetization of that and how it's carrying through the system. The second is the amount of uh, internal um, political, social, economic, uh, conflict that is now going on. And, um, and, and the third is uh, the rising of a great power um, to challenge uh, the existing world order and the existing world power of China and the geopolitical um, in which, uh, you know, when uh, I was born 1949 and uh, f five, four years after the new world order began in 45, and the United States, of course, was a much more dominant country then, had 80% of the world's gold, 50% of the world's economy, the only the monopoly on military power because of nuclear and all of that. And it's relative, it's declined on a relative basis. And that led me to do research, um, which I um, um, needed to do the five, last 500 years of research to follow. I wanted to study the rise and decline of currencies, reserve currencies, and their empires that I went back. And in doing that, um, I also discovered um, that their um, acts of nature um, actually had bigger effects than the first three of those, all, even with the wars, um, because of uh, droughts, floods, and um, uh, pandemics. Um, and I know that you're, uh, you really have uh, thoughts about climate change and its effects. So I'll, I'll be interested in hearing those because I think that's a factor. And then number five was the greatest, of course, is man's capacity to adapt and invent uh, because in one way or another, they, um, if you look at that, per capita income rises, living standards rise over periods of time. But these big cycles and these big events are dominant. So those are, I think almost everything can fall into those five categories, you know, um, and, uh, so that's how I look at it. Uh, just to quickly get into a few, how do you see those categories playing out right now? Is there anything specific that comes to mind? I think that, um, we're in a period, um, in which there's a supply and demand for debt and credit. Um, that is because one man's debts are another man's, a uh, assets. And, um, there's a supply demand for credit. Um, that is um, having an effect on um, making us move into a stagflation kind of environment. Uh, in other words, the trade-offs between the two will become more difficult. But I think that um, number two influence, the political, um, is the most important. Um, what I mean by that is um, I think we, we have been used to being in an environment um, in which um, economics uh, ruled. You know, you'd have a global economy and um, those who could produce items more efficiently or cheaper would get the business and they would raise their living standards and other places, you know, that, so it's a, it was a global competition largely by run by economic considerations 
and resources would shift that way. I think we're now in um, that doesn't exist as much that way. And there's been a transition to um, an ideological allocation of of resources and so on, such as, you know, the um, acquisition by Elon Musk of Twitter. It's not a financial transaction as much as it is uh, for the purpose of it'll have controls. And when we have the conflicts such as with Disney and DeSantis in Florida and those political ideologies, um, it's the the belief that um, economics has got to fall within that agenda. That'll have very big implications, I think. Um, and then, of course, this external. So I've been rambling here a little too long, threw a few things on the table, and I'll pass it over to you, Jeremy. Thanks, Ray. Yes, let's move the discussion now over to Jeremy. And Jeremy, you just heard the big dynamics that Ray has articulated as he looks at the current environment. And it would be great to get your perspective on the big things you're watching, too, especially considering some of your recent writing on stock market bubbles. I, I must say I'm in my old age reaching a point where I have a little trouble convincing myself that the stock market is that important and that uh, we live in an age where some much more important issues are playing out. And I know Ray shares that view to some considerable degree, but um, I, I view the stock market now um, really uh, as a, a hobby. And uh, the one thing that I have kept going is resources and climate change related investing, and also for old times sake, uh, investment bubbles, since I've been doing that for 40 or 50 years. And, um, and since I find myself unexpectedly in, in the third great investment bubble of, of my career uh, in, in uh, basically in the US. So um, I can't avoid it. And this is a wonderful day to be having this discussion. It's not only victory over Hitler in Russia day, but it's, it's also a day where uh, the market is showing signs of breaking down. Uh, through yesterday, it's the worst opening of a year for the S&P uh, since I was one year old in 1939. I am a pre-war baby, un unlike Ray. And, um, and of course, the NASDAQ is down, as we speak, 27.5% from its high, and, uh, and the Russell 2000 about 23, S&P about 15 and a half. So it's getting to be interesting. And as we were saying before, um, Bitcoin from some point in the last 24 hours is down 10% to uh, 32,000 and change. So that is getting interesting. And ARC, um, Kathy Wood's wonderful instrument is back to it where it was in 2018, I'm not kidding you. Uh, it is back below this entire event now, uh, which is quite remarkable, down 75% uh, from, from its peak, uh, as is AMC, down 75% from its peak. And, and the other um, meme stocks are in ragged disarray. So this is the real McCoy seems to be playing out pretty close to 2000. And I'm just wondering how you're assessing all this in the context of your research on asset bubbles. Always considered myself a fairly serious amateur historian. And what I've done in bubble territory is I, I don't try and build models to explain every day as you guys do. I, I focus on the four great bubbles uh, which are characterized by nearly hysterical behavior really seriously weird over optimism, which is very rare and uh, which are characterized by accelerated price moves on the upside uh, and, um, and, and by a weird uh, deviation on the upside between the blue chips going up 
and the risky stocks going down. And that, that is rare as hen's teeth. It happened brilliantly in 29. It happened during the year 2000, again, in spades, with the S&P X growth continuing to go up through September of 2000. And the growth stocks basically going down 50%, and the, and the uh, internet stocks dropping uh, maybe uh, 60 70% by then. So that was spectacular. And uh, we saw a very handsome deviation between the S&P rising last year and the Russell 2, uh, for example, dropping quite handsomely. So there was a 20, 25 point spread on the upside. And that for me is a pretty good indicator. And I, I'll tell you what it describes. It describes Mr. Prince's, I've got to keep dancing because the music's still playing. And we understand that completely, the enormous commercial imperative of the industry to play uh, up to and over the edge. But they're not complete idiots. And so they say, well, I've got to keep dancing, but I don't have to keep dancing with Puma Tech, the most advanced stock in 99. I'm going to transfer uh, to Coca-Cola. And I'll keep dancing off the edge, but I'll go off with Coca-Cola. And it works. The Coca-Colas may be handsomely overpriced, but in 1929 and 2000, 2001 and so on, they always go down a lot less as the bubble breaks. And that's the phenomenon that causes this very rare indicator of impending doom, which we saw uh, last year. And so by early this year, it seemed clear to me that this was not only the real McCoy bubble, which had been clear for a year or so, uh, in terms of pricing and, and enthusiasm, but it, it had triggered this very rare uh, indicator of impending doom, in other words, now. And so uh, our piece of a year and a bit ago was called Waiting for the Last Dance, and our equivalent follow-up this January was Let the Wild Rumpus Begin, i.e. we're in it, dudes, <laughs> and uh, I do believe we are. And I, I, I believe the declines will be very substantial. Ray, why don't we turn it to you now? Uh, I want to get your thoughts on how the trends you and Jeremy have been describing and have identified are likely to play out. What do you see over the next, let's say, five to 10 years in terms of some of these big inflection points that we may be going through? I think that uh, looking at it year by year, um, that uh, this is... This is the third year of the expansion with a, a very aggressive monetary policy. And um, so we're in the part of the typical expansion where there's um, a lot of inflation pressures because it happened in a giant big way. And we, we everybody's long, the world is at, it's the end of a paradigm because everybody uh, believes that uh, they want everything to go up. And of course, that creates a dynamic where policy is long, everything goes up. And of course, that happens by creating money and uh, credit, debt, and which creates debt. And that dynamic means that you must have a decline in real wealth me measured by that, because that's the financial wealth has become enormous relative to the real wealth. Everybody who's holding bonds um, or assets, the, particularly the debt assets, um, believes, or financial assets in general, um, which are just journal entries, they're, they're claims, um, but they believe that they can take that buying power and sell it and buy goods and services, and they can't. And by its necessity, there must be negative real returns, negative re, um, re, uh, returns relative to um, um, buying power. So if we take it chronologically, I think um, there's the short-term cycle, which is usually the business cycle, takes you know seven years on average and give or take, depending on where you start the cycle, um, give or take a few years. I think we're moving along here quicker. So we're now going to be in a very tight environment um, and that uh, changes everything. Um, so when we look at the returns of equities um, and we look at the well-being of companies, um, you see that um, um, the, 
um, the cost of interest relative to the expected returns of equities um, creates a squeeze on equities, create changes the economics. A lot of borrowing has been done at much lower interest rates and so on. The return on equity for a company and the versus the return, um, uh, the cost of, that, of debt um, ha, is changing and all of those things are, are changing. And like all bubbles or paradigm shifts, the mentality that uh, did exist we don't have to worry about inflation. Cash is a safe place, and so on. Gets a shock. There's a punch in the face. There's been a 40-year bull market, and there's a punch in the face to the, all investors. We're going through it, as Jeremy describes. And um, when that happens, um, things that were um, never supposed to happen because everybody believes in the tech companies and that, that which is the same as the nifty 50 or the um um the dot com companies they get hammered right so like you say 75 percent decline in um kathy wood's funds and so so and so forth that um causes the adaptation so we're in the beginning of that adaptation that is most similar i think to the 1970s period um and um it becomes financial um and uh so i think um as we are in we'll come to the 2022 elections um and and that'll have economics and markets has a big impact so we'll be in the 2022 elections i think that you'll see greater political extremism coming out of that moderates are leaving um, and even those who are running are populists. Populists are people who will fight to win and will not accept losing and will fight for their constituency. So you'll see more populism of the left and more populism of the right. So if I look at 2023, I look at 2024 and I'm uh, worried about the, um, the neither side accepting losing. And I think that there's a big risk that nobody that this system went, is in jeopardy because history has shown when the causes that people are behind are greater of greater importance to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. Um, those types of things change the world landscape. I'm emphasizing the United States and and to, and certainly Europe is in that type of a position. So um, I think that that when I look at it. Um, um, it'll be very important to not only diversify well, but to be able to be long and short different assets in order to perform well in, in that environment. Jeremy, Ray just described how he's seen some of the risks ahead in terms of politics and the risks of rising debt, inflation, and the debasement of buying power. Anything else you would add to that? Listening to Ray is that we we have a market today which feels superficially like 2000. And I think it's going to play out initially like 2000. And then unfortunately is going to phase, as he suggests, into the 70s, where the uh, deflationary effects on the economy and the stock market uh, will, re will result in a world rather like the 70s, where all assets are simply much lower priced than they are today. Um, Oh, a word on, on inflation, too. I completely agree with Ray on, on the short-term problems, which I, I would summarize as monetary and, and, and general Federal Reserve overstimulus for 30, 35 years. The war and COVID, all of those three influences guaranteeing that we have a relatively intractable problem in the short to intermediate term. But what, what worries me is the longer term arguments for inflation, which is one, we are running out of people. In China, where the 500 million extra farmers precipitated globalization, they have now had diminishing cohorts of 20 year olds for 20 years. And they are guaranteed since they're alive now, we know the baby cohorts are dropping like a stone. They are simply going to have a shortage of labor as is the developed world together. That is not a 
a trivial block, the developed world plus China, all of them will be squeezed for labor. After the bubonic plague, they had a hundred year honeymoon period in which wages went up so much it wasn't reached for another several hundred years in the industrial revolution. And we are entering a, a period where labor is simply scarce, which feels to me inflationary. And at the same time, we have a, a scarcity beginning in resources. And we keep an original unusual uh, index at GMO. It's 36 equal weighted important, the most important commodities. So it's not dominated by oil. And it showed a declining pattern for 102 years from 1900 to 2002. And yes, it was interrupted by World War I and World War II and OPEC, why wouldn't it be? But it wanted to go down. It went down 70%. It took the index down to 30. Today, 122 years later, the index is down 10%. It has gone to 90. The average important commodity has just spent the last 20 years going from 30 to 90. It has tripled. The reason is, of course, the growth of China, but I believe fairly passionately looking at the data that it also represents uh, the intrinsic scarcity, the war between deeper wells, worse iron ore, et cetera. The best go first. The struggle is always between technology, which for 100 years got ahead of scarcity. It was two paces down for deeper and three and a half paces up for technology. And now we've reached a phase where we've gone through that stuff. And now we have two paces up for technology and three paces down for scarcity. We, the data is screaming at us now for 20 years that we're beginning to run out. It doesn't, and a war of course, and COVID, we're so fragile, all you have to do is cough now and it ricochets around the world in price spikes and, 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 and shortages and bottlenecks. And that is the world we better get used to living in. We're going to have a world of increasing number of bottlenecks and shortages. And the same applies to food. The UN food index is higher today than any time in its history of the last 50 years since it started, okay? So you, you, you have price pressure on raw materials, metals, food. You have price pressure long-term on labor. This surely feels like a new era in which uh, inflation will be part of the background music, just like it was in the 20th century and perhaps more so. Ray also mentioned the dangers of high debt levels, and you've certainly spoken about that in the past. And so could you share some of your thoughts there as well? The risks of a debt bubble breaking and the risks of an equity bubble breaking have simply not been understood by our Federal Reserve since Paul Volcker. They are incredibly naive. They haven't even got a clue. They're not even interested in the idea. The idea, Bernanke saying, oh, the U.S. housing market always has never declined. It merely reflects a strong U.S. economy. Alan Greenspan encouraging, et cetera, et cetera, uh, right through until today. They don't realize that they're playing with such fire. My second point, high levels of debt are, are just far too often seriously dangerous and uh, should be in general discouraged actively. That should be one of the responsibilities of top management, including the Fed, et cetera. And let me just give you an example. Why, why do you like low rates? Because it encourages debt. Why do you like more debt? Because it encourages growth. That's the argument. So let me give you the ultimate statistical test of that. We start in 1985, and we have been modestly increasing the debt to GDP ratio, all debt together, uh, just drifting slightly up due to technology. And then the technology, I mean the introduction of more and more sophisticated financial instruments, but not rising dramatically. And then in 85, it kills to a 45 degree angle and shoots across any page and goes from about 1.1 times GDP to well over three. So in that little window of 35 years, we triple the debt to GDP ratio. 
It's a big chunk of time. It's the biggest, most important economy on the planet, a pretty good test. So what happens to growth? It inflects downwards. And from 85, we grow more slowly. Grant you, there are many other factors at work. It's a complicated picture. But there is little room in that equation for the idea that more debt creates more growth. It is not proven in the data. It is held to be the case. It is an assumption like most of modern economics, but it is not proven by the data. I would suggest that there is no evidence at all that increased levels of macro debt to GDP have anything to do with growth. They have everything to do with higher risk, though, from time to time. Ray, I want to turn it back to you. You and Jeremy have described a very difficult environment with a lot of potential for risk and instability. How, as an investor, how should we think about uh, positioning for something like that? My main things are, um, first, um, cash is trash. Um, um, and um, that there's in uh, bonds and, and, and debt, um, it's, it's not going to be good. And the claims of financial assets. So either avoid those or position yourselves uh, so that when those things operate and, and, and position yourself for inflation. Um, and um, so there are um, investments, lots of investments pertaining to inflation. I agree with Jeremy's comments about commodities. And, and, the, and the big commodity cycles are reactive. There's, there's a giant, just like the 40-year the bull market in bonds um, associates with a commodity cycle where everybody adapts to that. Companies don't hedge. Um, um, inventories are drawn down. There's less investment in those things. That, when that switches, switches to that kind of an environment. And the big overarching thing is that the amount of financial claims that exist, and, and there's charts in my uh, that I repeatedly show when I deal with the uh, changing world order. What is the amount of financial claims, assets, relative to real assets? And you could see that through history, when those financial claims, it's like a, a bank has too many IOUs on its real money and that thing, then you always get into these environments where it's undesirable to own the debt and you have negative real returns. And so to position one's portfolio in a tilt that way. But of course, the way that we do it is to separate alpha and beta, right? So two parts, core, because uh, core, we're all talking tactical. How do you create a truly well-balanced um, core portfolio? And we know that the typical well portfolio is not well-balanced with its greatest vulnerability being in that upper right quadrant in our box, which is the inflation box. And we know that we're in that environment. So from a starting point of view, I would encourage all investors to look at that box, those four quadrant box, that box that we have, rising inflation, falling inflation, rising um, real growth relative to discounted, falling real growth relative to discounted, and see what the biases are in those portfolios. I believe that now you can simultaneously reduce risk and raise returns reduce risk of that portfolio by having more in that upper right quadrant, rising inflation, and you will reduce your risk because if you look at your portfolio, typical investor's portfolio, that is the environment that it is missing. So you start with that. How do you get more neutral? How do you get better balanced? And you cover yourself from that exposure. And then you make your tactical moves around it. And the tactical moves, again, should not be in those debts. It should be very well diversified. I think that the social and political conflicts are, bit, are going to be a big investment thing coming forward. And so that'll mean, and the way I look at it is, I want to look at places that have good income statements and balance sheets. So when I say places, I mean countries, as well as individuals that make up those countries, the individual people and the individual uh, companies. 
So do they have a good income statement, financial stability? Do they have a good balance sheet so that they can weather those things? And also, it's a sign of their productivity. Are they productive? And then number two, are they civil with each other? I really do believe that internal conflict and bad finances are going to be well uh, uh, defining characteristics of where to invest or even where to be. And then if I carry that forward to the third, do, am I going to have uh, in, the, in the risk of being in a, in a international war, an important international war? Because that international war will um, raise um, lots of threats. So I want, uh, uh, when I'm picking those locations, I, I, I want to be out of the finance, uh, those, those debt instruments, largely minimized on the, on the financials, the inflation hedge assets, well diversified, look to parts of the world that are not as plagued with this. Um, so emerging Asia is very interesting. India is interesting. So diversify. Look at neutral countries during that period of time. Watch out for um, government controls on capital markets, because that's the logical next step. History has shown that. Watch out for foreign exchange controls. Could be. Watch out uh, for those things. So those are the themes that um, I think are most important and will be most important in, in investing. Jeremy, Ray just described his framework for diversifying a portfolio. And, and obviously that is so important to preserving wealth, particularly in an environment today. So do you have any thoughts on diversification today? Ray made me think that when we're selling our resource portfolio, we, uh, we have a, a wonderful exhibit that looks at the correlation between all the major sectors, utilities, consumption, and so on, consumer goods. And there's only one where as the time period lengthens, the correlation drops, and that is a resource. And resources drops to such good effect that based on the last 80 years of data, every rolling 10-year period, that the 10-year uh, correlation is negative. So if you believe um, in inflation, you know that resources do very well. You also know that in the long run, it's strongly negative. It's negatively correlated modestly with the rest of the portfolio. As we're seeing today, when they do well, it puts a burden on the rest of the economy and they do bad. So there is a very strong case here for a resource portfolio. Um, on resources, just a, a point that um, the last time we had a, a, a super bubble in commodities, there were very large new mines waiting to come online. What has happened since the 2011 crunch when China slowed down in its heavy industrializer and the growth rate on, on, of, for iron ore and coal dropped from double digit to zero, dead flat for three years in a row, uh, breaking the back of the, of the resource industry. They have not done any capex. It takes five to 15 years to bring on a mine. They have not been doing this. There are no great reserves of lithium, cobalt, copper, nickel, even iron ore to come online this time. And everybody knows it. If you look at the need for these particularly green metals, greening metals, there are, there, it doesn't compute. There are no backup resources. And that applies right across the length and breadth of resources. They have not been capexing even in oil and gas uh, for, uh, for the last 10 years to a remarkable degree. Ray, th there is an important question that I wanna get to, and it's related to uh, concerns that you've shared about the US dollar potentially losing its reserve currency status. Uh, as an investor, uh, how should they think about constructing a portfolio given this concern that you've talked about? Well, there are two purposes of a currency, which is a medium of exchange and a storehold of wealth. And we're living in a world where um, we have um, three major currencies are fiat uh, currencies with the same kind of problems. So you can't look at one currency in relationship to another. I think people make a lot of mistakes of thinking, uh, you know, it's an ugly contest. 
And, um, and so um, the questions that we're going to be in is storehold of wealth. Okay, what is your storehold of wealth? And a money is a storehold of wealth that also is widely accepted in other countries so that you can move it around. It's not just limited to currencies. Don't, don't think that medium of exchange is, going, is the only important thing. So think about the store of the wealth. That's when we deal with the quadrant of the, you know, the four pieces to try to find a balanced storehold of wealth. And then you have to think, can I move that and sell that anywhere? Am I going to have the free capital markets to do that? Or are they going to be a problem? So the diversification of that. And I think we are in entering a period where all currencies, the traditional medium of exchange type of currencies, are um, going to, every a lot of currencies will compete. What will be the medium in which I could take something and go someplace else and cost effectively convert that into buying? Okay, the medium of exchange. So I think we're in a storehold of wealth issue. Um, in other words, focus in on that. And then, okay, your transaction cost of converting that storehold of wealth a balanced portfolio into buying power. And then you transact because even in the worst inflations, the worst environments, um, the currencies, most of the time, still could be mediums of exchange, even though they're devalued. So I encourage people to think about bad fiat currencies generally um, and think about storeholds of wealth and what the liquidity is, and think about even what capital wars look like. And in terms of uh, storeholds of wealth, I'm wondering if you have any particular asset in mind. So for example, would gold serve that purpose? Gold um, as a overlay on a portfolio, on top of a portfolio, works like an insurance policy. Gold is a dead asset. It just sits there. But it's always through, it's, a, it's got characteristics that are limited in supply. One of the most important things, it's the third highest reserve currency held by central banks. And in periods of time of war or such periods of time of credibility, um, it is the medium, like they say, it's the, it's the only asset that you could have that's not somebody else's liability. That means you have to be dependent on them giving you it, you them giving you money or they giving you something. Um, and it's, it is international. It can be moved and it, it's tried and true. So in, in that regard, but its behavior is in very environmentally specific. Um, so as a hedge asset, as an overlay, um, it's, it's really like a great insurance policy because when the other assets go down, and so something like that, or the equivalent, um, uh, plays a, uh, a role in a portfolio, not as the core asset, but as the effect of diversification of asset. And that's, if you do it as an overlay, it's about 15% of the portfolio, not taking away assets from other um, parts of the portfolio. So, but I come back to my basics, which is the four quadrants you know, the timeless and universal. The one thing that you could be sure of is that cash will not be the best asset class. And when you diversify to a portfolio, so you got a well-balanced portfolio of other things, whenever you have that diversified portfolio, it, it will outperform cash because it's the nature of the system. Uh, people, you know, the central bank puts money on deposit. People with better ideas come along take elements of risk and it works. When that diversified portfolio of asset classes doesn't work well, that balance, there are times, um, it works um, better than the traditional portfolio in the down moves by a lot. Um, like when the markets and uh, the, goes down 60% or so, it, um, the worst cases are like 20%, maybe a little bit over than that. And it never stays there because central banks can't let capitalism, which is dependent on those other assets performing a higher return than cash, can't let that continue. 
So they come in there and they produce money and credit and it produces the pop. So I think in terms of like, again, I want to emphasize what I said before, think in terms of storeholds of wealth, how you can move it from country to country where it's acceptable in that way. And don't let's um, view money just through that idea of the fiat currency, um, because a fiat currency is cash, is short term cash and cash is trash. Jeremy, we're coming to the uh, end of our time. But before we go, I want to circle back to something you said at the beginning, that your major focus recently has been on the environment and climate change. And so can you say more about that issue and how you're thinking about it? And, and perhaps we can close on that. Um, I think the world has simply been running way over its capacity. And uh, the great luxury of the last 200 years of fossil fuels, coal and then oil and gas, have catapulted us far above our long-term ability to sustain. And it, the good news is it catapulted science and research as well as income and consumption. And uh, we're gonna have to rely enormously on research and our inventiveness uh, to save our bacon. And I do believe there is a decent chance that it will. Um, Quite a number of years ago, I got into studying the rise and fall of civilizations. And uh, I always like to recommend uh, Immoderate Greatness by, uh, by Ophuls, O-P-H-U-L-S. He's done all the heavy lifting for us. He's in a series of chapters declined all the, uh, uh, condensed all the re major reasons for civilizations failing in the past. And he's read everything. He knows it like the back of his hand. And it's like the cliff notes, very, very serious, well-written, quotable cliff notes on civilizations failing. And, and he gives five or six major reasons, which include uh, overburdening the local environment, your soil and, and, and your nature and your water. Uh, complexity, which is very energy intensive and, and so on. And he concludes two things, one, that the current global civilization checks off every single one of them, which is rather creepy. And, um, and two, that humans appear to be hardwired to self-destruct. And, and my take on that is that like every other organism, we've spent a few million years uh, fighting for survival, and we have learned to grab what we can when we can. And like other organisms to grow, we propagate as much, basically as much as we can for our first few million years. And uh, we'll expand to fill the space available. And um, we are not programmed to think about long-term, slow-moving uh, consequences. And so we don't. And we have, we have to look at things today like the president of Brazil encouraging the greatest deforestation in Brazil's history in the last 12 months uh, to everybody's shock. <laughs> but we also have to live in a world where uh, President Trump was doing his best uh, to uh, to undo all the good that EPA and environmental movements have been trying to do. It's pretty bizarre to have a couple of serious countries <coughs> attempting to ignore the greatest threat, perhaps for hundreds of years. And uh, I, I believe that we do have some escape clauses from Mr. Ophel's uh, prediction of self-destruction. And, and that is uh, twofold. One, unexpected by everybody, including Malthus in 1798, we are choosing, despite getting wealthier, we are choosing to have fewer children since 1961. It's a remarkably unexpected outcome. It was not predicted, as far as I'm aware, by anybody, uh, let's say, as recently as 1950. 
And, and the degree and the speed with which fertility rates are contracting is not really appreciated by anybody, including the financial community. We are not only way down from replacement rate in every developed country except Israel, uh, but we are, if anything, accelerating. And uh, so in the US, we're at 1.65 versus 1.21, uh, 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 1.2 for re- 1.2.1 children. We're at 1.65. And so way down a quarter below what is necessary. And many countries in Europe, uh, Italy, Hungary, are way below that. And of course, in the Far East, uh, you culminate in South Korea, which has incidentally overtaken Japan in individual wealth, uh, individual income, I should say. Um, they, they have a fertility rate below one. I mean, it's just inconceivable. And uh, China, Japan, Taiwan uh, are all down there at the 1.5 level. Uh, quite remarkable. And this is not a sufficient condition to save our bacon, but it is a very necessary condition. Jeremy, you're saying that one of the pressures working in our favor is less people. So that obviously leads to less pressure on natural resources. What's the second factor working in our favor? The other factor is the speed of our science and the fact that, if anything, it seems to be maybe accelerating. And we do have some getting out of jail free cards. Thank heavens. Um, the problems we face basically are all the cures so far have been contained within a finite, um, a finite uh, world. We're trying to compound on a finite planet. But the get out of jail free cards have a whiff of the infinite. And they are fusion, a source of infinite energy if we can pull it off. It's green. We never run out. And it may be cheap. It remains to be seen. Uh, I'm reasonably optimistic, but it's certainly far from a probability of one. Um, Geothermal, the ability to drill several miles down and tap the heat of the inner core, which is more, for all intents and purposes, infinite and green. And we have a a vast uh, learning curve from fracking to tap into, but but there are massive problems of dealing with the heat several miles down, uh, but not necessarily problems that we won't learn to handle. And the third one is a major breakthrough in energy storage to go through, to go with the spectacular progress of solar and wind. Again, year after year has outperformed early forecasts. If you look at the international energy authorities and others, you will see an almost laughable pattern where each forecast for 2030 has been below uh, the actual each year it's ramping up. It's like an investment model model that never learns from the past, it seems. But if we can take the cost of energy storage down to 10 cents or 20 cents on the dollar from today and, and, and blend it and, and mix it with uh, solar and wind, that will also be basically an infinite source of, of uh, green energy. So I like to say, in all probability, the lack of cheap, available green energy is not the factor that will bring us to our knees. Uh, the problem is the time it will take to get there. We have wasted arguably 50 years, uh, getting the point that climate change is ultimately dangerous. And uh, by the time we have all this cheap green energy, uh, an enormous amount of damage will have been done. And the parts per million in the atmosphere will have gone from what we need, which is about 300 280 to 300, where you get a very stable world. Uh, It's currently 420, and it is on its way for sure beyond 500. This is the kind of burden that we will have to to deal with. And if we have 
fusion or one of the others, we will be able to set about the slow, steady uh, business of uh, subtracting uh, carbon dioxide and returning uh, the planet to a decent state. So if we have that and we combine with a declining population, um, we, we, we really do have a, a chance of survival, as I like to say. Jeremy, I know the Grantham Foundation is working very hard on some of these technological solutions, the climate change that you've described. We are, thank heavens, a very inventive species. And uh, our foundation for the protection of the environment is, is, has a target of 50% green venture capital and 25% other early stage venture capital. The world is getting behind the need to green the economy, getting behind the need to be frugal with resources and change and improve the food structure. The governments are getting behind it. Corporations are getting behind it. Why would early stage new enterprises in those areas not be a candidate for highest return on the planet? I think they are. And it's thoroughly exciting. It, it gives a sense of purpose and it may very well be the best investment you can make. The top line revenue of people going to solve climate change is going to dwarf the rest of the economy. It's the top line of electric vehicles versus the top line of the old vehicles, the top line of, of electricity versus fossil fuels, the top line of efficiency versus business as usual. That's where the growth will be. All right, I think we'll wrap it up there. Jeremy and Ray, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I, I hope we can do this again sometime soon. It was a real pleasure. And it's always a pleasure, Jeremy. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, Alex, that was a lot of fun. I hope we can do this again also sometime soon. I, I had a lot of fun, Jim, and I look forward to it as well.